and welcome to the Real World Industry Analysis from Astranti Financial Training. This video is going to give you the industry context for the November Management Case Study Exam and our case study company is Portophone. Before I get going, a little bit about who I am. My name is Richard Lewis. I'm a strategic specialist here at Astranti. I'm one of your study text authors, particularly on the strategic side. And I began my career about 18 years ago as a financial journalist, covering everything from supply chain management to uh, picking apart financial statements to find the story inside, what was being hidden on the balance sheet and what was being covered up by the uh, numbers. I became a business analyst 10 years ago and started to map the strategy of companies in certain industries and follow the IT trends, market trends, consumer spending trends, uh, logistics, financials and macroeconomics. And so that's the experience that I'm bringing to bear on the industry pack for you. And it's from that perspective that I'll be giving you my analysis. OK, so I've already gone through the pre-scene itself uh, in quite a detailed way in the other videos. So the point of this particular video is to give you the real world context. So in the exam, you're going to be expected to answer questions as though you are actually working in the industry itself. And so you need to take with you into the exam some knowledge of the industry and how it works. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to scoot through uh, the first uh, bit on the history uh, and actually start here on this page uh, where it talks about the mobile internet. And I'm not going to cover every single uh, aspect of the industry plan. There's about 90 pages to it. We'll never get through it all. I'm really going to pick out the key points and the highlights uh, that I really want to emphasize for you. OK, so you can read up in the industry back about the history of the mobile phone industry. What I want to do is start here in 1999, where 26% of all adults in the UK owned mobile phones. And what were they doing with them? Well, voice communications. They were talking to each other on their mobile phones. And the funny thing is, and the ironic thing is, that's probably the last thing we use them for today. As the speed and bandwidth available uh, over mobile connections uh, got better, voice calls faded from importance and then we saw firstly uh, instant messaging by M SMS and then mobile broadband internet uh, and then mobile internet enabled computing become the key drivers of demand in the industry and that set the scene for the creation in 2007 of the smartphone. The next thing I want to bring up is the difference between various aspects of the industry. OK, we have basically three separate but interdependent industries at play. There's the hardware industry and this is about devices. This is about mobile phone handsets and this is what Portaphone does. OK, however, they need software to run. So there's another industry that's all about developing software. If you've got a Samsung phone, it operates Google software, doesn't it? Android is the name of the operating system. Uh, and so people that make mobile phones uh, like Samsung don't have to develop their own software. They can simply install other people's software. And that means you've got two different companies that are interdependent because Google can't get its Android software to market without a smartphone manufacturer and Samsung can't sell its phones unless they can operate uh, a decent piece of software. Today Apple's iOS uh, and Google's Android are the dominant operating systems. There are other ones but those are the dominant ones. Okay and then here I want to pick up on the development of the so-called smartphone. This is about the mobile operating software itself acting as a platform on which third-party software developers can build apps. 
Okay, so we have a system now where when you have a phone, it doesn't just come bundled with its own uh, funny uh, operating system that you have to learn when you get a new phone, but it comes with a platform that we recognize and on which uh, developers can actually uh, build applications that you can then download and run. So it makes the phone into a pocket-sized portable computer. Now we know this, but it's important to remember that this has only been around since 2008. Okay, and then the last uh, interdependent industry that's part of the mobile phone world uh, is the services industry, and this is mainly uh, network services. So what happens is, if you are a phone manufacturer, uh, your phone isn't much good unless the user can connect to a network and make calls. And so uh, you have a company like Apple, which makes iPhones, which are completely useless unless there are people like AT&T uh, in the US providing the networks. Okay, so now that we understand that three-pronged industry, let's have a look and see how that applies to our pre-scene. So in the pre-scene, we learn that Portaphone only trades in the device hardware market and actually pivoted from doing other things uh, in its history uh, to only make mobile phones now. Okay, so it doesn't operate in the network market and it doesn't operate uh, in the software market. We don't know what operating software Portaphone's devices run, but what we can infer from this is that Portaphone is entirely dependent on other companies. That means that whatever happens to any one of those interdependent companies or industries actually will affect the fortunes of Portaphone. Okay, so if its network, uh, its main network customer in Farland goes down, then it's got some problems, hasn't it? All right, so let's move on and have a look at the hardware industry. What I just want to pick out here is the high level of penetration uh, in the mobile phone ownership. In 2000, 26% uh, of people in the UK had uh, a mobile phone. Uh, by 2010, we got to nearly 90% of all people. So that whole decade basically saw most people get a mobile phone, whereas they really hadn't before. What had driven this level of penetration? Really, it was the development of 3G uh, network technology, and that meant that broadband internet connection was now possible over the networks, and that enabled Apple to release the revolutionary iPhone, the first smartphone, okay, which featured a, a large touch screen. It's the um, design that we're now familiar with, uh, and you can actually use it to run all kinds of applications, like any computer, and you can watch widescreen videos on it. Okay, so not only did we get a much richer uh, mobile internet experience, but we got this mobile mini computer. So we're all of a sudden, instead of just a telephone, we've now got a camera, ebook reader, music, media players, calculators, calendars, and all kinds of other innovative applications. People do things on smartphones uh, that uh, they could previously only do on laptops. So that's the world we're pretty much still living in, although uh, the technology and design has advanced. We are living in a smartphone nation. However, the way that we're using them has changed. Once you tell people that the phone in their pocket can now actually help them choose a restaurant or do their supermarket shopping, then they're going to start changing the way that they use it and then you're going to start to get much wider adoption. And so it's precisely the wider application of the smartphone that's actually driven uh, penetration in the market. People use it for all kinds of things uh, beyond messaging. They're making music and videos. Um, they're using it for GPS tracking and all kinds of other things. So when you take that into account, you can understand that the growth in the mobile phones is only coming from smartphones. There's not much demand for this kind of old-fashioned 
uh, kind of phone. Uh, still a little bit, about 15 to 18 percent of the US market. Uh, what I do know is that most of this, uh, 50 percent in the figures I found, uh, most for some companies is coming from the over 60 age group. So this is not uh, a growth market. This is not where uh, R&D investments being spent. Some companies are still operating these phones as kind of cash dogs, uh, but really uh, there's not much coming from there. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us that for the time being, smartphones is it. We've not really found a way to go beyond that. How do you go beyond everything? I mean, there are uh, innovations to be had here because you've got the fact that you want this ease of use and a comfortable browsing experience. You want to be able to watch movies and things. And that's the sort of thing that's provided by a large touchscreen. But you also need uh, to be able to carry this thing in your pocket. So you need a small light device. So those are two opposing factors. And this is pretty much the only area that's driving any innovation uh, at the moment is how do you how do you get it better and smaller at the same time and so that's uh, causing some very fierce competition with innovations being largely small increments now we haven't got the full figures in for 2016 yet but we're looking at about 2.1 billion people in the world uh, this year owning a smartphone and uh, we're going to see that uh, possibly rise to 2.7 billion by 2019. Okay, so it's growing, but growth is slow because most people have got one now. All right, let's have a look at the sales channels. M most new mobile phones uh, in the UK uh, and um, other uh, developed economies are being sold by the networks, so sometimes known as carriers. Uh, and these phones are coming bundled with service contracts. Usually they're sold at a significant discount. That's important when it comes to thinking about the buyer power of the networks. So it's possible to get a mobile phone uh, as a pay-as-you-go. That's when you buy prepaid credits. But generally uh, these are more expensive to get. So more and more what we're seeing is that beyond discounting the price of the phone, networks are now tending to basically give you a, a two-year micro loan. They're, they're loaning you uh, the uh, money to have the phone straight away, and then you're paying them back as a very small component of your monthly service fee. So this enables uh, consumers to upgrade uh, their handset when they renew and keep their repayments the same. Uh, and it also means that you can, you can stay up to date with uh, the advances uh, without having that outlay up front. And of course, it's an incentive for, the, uh, for consumers to stay with the network. OK, let's uh, move ahead. I've listed some of the major networks here in the UK. What I want to pick out here is how all of this applies to the pre-scene. Uh, if we've got growth coming solely from smartphones, then it follows that you need to focus your research and development uh, in smartphones. OK, so non-smartphone technology uh, is very basic, the needs here. And so uh, these customers are not interested really in uh, new or expanded features. So there's no point investing here. So these are basically cash dogs. They're low profit, low growth products. And normally, if you've got a dog, you would divest it. Uh, but of course, if you did that, you'd actually cut off sales completely to that demographic because they wouldn't make the shift up to smartphones. So you're, en you're ending up with a cash dog, which you've got to harvest for as long as that demographic's still buying. OK, now that's important because if you're looking for a divestment opportunity for Porter Firm, um, you don't necessarily want to divest the feet. They call them feature phones, <laughs> not dumb phones in the industry, refers to them as feature phones. Uh, and you wouldn't normally want to uh, divest it straight away because it's still bringing in some cash. And that's important for your cash flow. Next. What I want to uh, focus on is the market dynamic. If you use Porter's five forces to analyze what we've just been discussing, then we can see 
uh, that competitive rival is very high because the saturation of the market is very high. You've got a high threat of substitution uh, and you've got a threat of new entrants, which is high as well. And what that means is that you end up with a low profit market and that's only growing very slowly. So this isn't the most attractive market uh, for a business. There's no functional difference between your iPhone and the nearest Samsung uh, alternative. Uh, really, you're buying a brand and some engineering uh, and some design when you buy the Apple iPhone. And so, really, competitors in this market are dealing with perfect substitutes. And it means that they have to accept the market price. They can only really make normal profits. So they can't significantly... Uh, Portafone couldn't significantly hike its prices just to gain a bit of margin because the competition would keep the prices down. So the question for us becomes how can Portafone increase its profitability in a market like the one that we've got? If you look at your options via Ansoft's matrix, then what you discover is a market penetration strategy, the least risky strategy, fails because the market's already saturated. Okay? So where do you go? New product development is an option uh, and here we'd really be looking at uh, wearables. Tablets is an option. There's no tablet computer, uh, you know, like an iPad uh, mentioned in the pre-scene. But when you look at the real world industry, tablets have sort of tailed off. I think they're done. I think the growth is coming from wearables and because they use uh, either similar or very identical technology, uh, this could be quite an easy pivot. And because they're quite new, Portafone could operate a, a price skimming model uh, and capture high profits from early adopters of wearables. Okay, but the products don't have to be consumer facing. Portafone could just as easily enter the component manufacturing market. Uh, Samsung is a precedent for this. Samsung actually began uh, in the smartphone industry as a component manufacturer making memory for iPhones and then <laughs> launched a competing phone uh, against its uh, best customer. And if Portafone was to do this, then obviously taking inputs vertical would reduce supplier power, uh, but it would also enable Portafone to create a barrier to entry, which would reduce the threat of new entrants. So it could address some of the high forces in the market by such a strategy. It could also look at market development. We know Portafone is already very highly internationalized, so it would need to... Uh, really carefully consider what markets would be good to enter. Asia, we can see from the pre-scene, has slowed right down. Uh, it's probably due to uh, high competition from Chinese manufacturers like Huawei. The only real growth opportunity I see on the pre-scene is the Middle East, so maybe Portafone ought to consolidate its efforts there. And then lastly, diversification is an option for them. This is obviously the most risky, but one contender would be for Portafone to enter the network business itself, and that would greatly reduce buyer power from the networks, but it would require significant investment in infrastructure. And Portafone does seem to have quite a lot of money, um, but it might be uh, easier and quicker for them to either acquire or to launch a JV uh, with another company. All right, so what sort of products are launched on this market? Well, uh, we mustn't forget the tablet computers, these uh, portable touchscreen computers uh, that may or may not be enabled with uh, cellular uh, connectivity. Some come with Wi-Fi only. Uh, these are your iPads and so forth. Uh, they tend to be offered still uh, by most phone manufacturers uh, to compete with the iPad. And what's a little bit odd about the pre-scene is that Portafone uh, doesn't appear to make any uh, tablets. So from my perspective, it's probably not the uh, best market to jump into now. They're a bit late to the show, to be honest. I think we've, ha we've reached peak tablet. I think they'd be better to uh, launch into wearables. But what the rise of the tablet computer uh, does uh, show us is that consumers have made 
the conceptual leap away from using their phones as telephones uh, and into using them as connected devices and connected devices of all kinds I think is where the future is going to be. So I've said that it's a bit of a no-brainer uh, to enter uh, the tablet market. I don't think it's going to bring them uh, their biggest growth, but it seems odd that they don't have a play there. So let's move on. When you look at the uh, product life cycle of a mobile phone, uh, we've got the material phase, the production phase, the transportation phase, and then we have the use phase, and then we have the disposal phase. And what I pick out uh, of this bit is the fact that given the size of Portaphone and the fact that it sells globally it ought to have massive buying power so I want to know why is Portaphone paying such a high unit price for its uh, screens, its wireless apparatus and its cases these are important inputs that it can't do without how is it that it's paying out so much. I know these are the more expensive components when it comes to making a phone, but a company of this size ought to be looking at lowering uh, those input costs, particularly since we've seen sales uh, leaping up between 2014 and 2015, so it really should uh, leverage its increased buyer power to get the cost down on those components. And one way into that, of course, might be to consider the end-of-life uh, phase uh, in the product life cycle. Um, you need to find ways to persuade consumers to upgrade their phones and keep buying. And what I suggest is perhaps um, providing disposal services, which would demonstrate their corporate social responsibility, but would have the knock-on benefit of getting uh, expensive materials back to their company so they could actually recycle those and perhaps get the uh, cost down of making new phones. Now, when it comes to research and development, you can't emphasize enough that in an industry like this, it's pretty much the most important aspect. Uh, and what concerns me is the low research and development spend at Portafone, and it's flat year on year. That tells me they're not really uh, trying hard enough to innovate, and that is a bit of a worry going forward. Were I a shareholder, I might be a bit worried. The other thing I'm a bit worried about uh, when I look at Portafone compared to the industry is the low value of goodwill. Now, when you compare that to the industry at large, what you find is that patents is a really big deal because you've got companies that are patenting uh, pretty much everything they possibly can. Every slight change in a process gets patented and then they're suing each other over them all. And I really feel that the lack of innovation at Portafone is a, a risk to them going forward. Now before I go, I do want to remind you that Astranti Financial Training offers a range of materials beyond what you've seen here, including the study text, the full study text, the course videos, which actually drill down chapter by chapter and really get to the nub of things. The pre-scene analysis uh, goes a little bit deeper into things, and the industry analysis gives you the real-world context so that you become an expert in your case study industry. Mock exams are available, along with marking and feedback from our tutors. And then there are master classes, which are given by experts. All of which is covered by the Astranti Pass Guarantee. So I hope you'll take a moment to check those out, and I'll see you on the next one.